Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and welcome to the second session of uh, Isra Drama International Exposure of Israeli Theater 2020. Before we start, I'd just like to say once again that this uh, convention could not have come to fruition if it were not for the hard work and devotion of uh, the members of our artistic team and our good friends at the Ministry of Culture, Dr. Irit Fogel-Geva, head of the Theater and Fringe Department in the Ministry, and uh, Guy Gutman, advisor to the Minister of Culture and Sport, and our good friends at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ziv Nivo Kuhlman, Sharon Caballo, and Anat Gilad. Thank you all very much once again. Uh, our second session tonight focuses on some of the big names of Israeli dramaturgy, those who already proved to have international appeal and acclaim. Historically, theater is quite a new phenomenon in Jewish life and culture, whereas the rest of the Western world have been practicing theater ever since ancient Greece. Uh, Jews joined the party just 2,300 years ago, some 150 years ago, actually. Uh, Orthodox Judaism rejected the sheer concept of theater and of human presentation on stage and its moral nature for ages, and the first theatrical performance in Hebrew, the holy language, took uh, place some 100 years ago. Unlike the enormous contribution and influence of Jewish artists in the fields of music and literature, there are no Jews among the great masters of drama. I think the first one that pops into mind is probably Mr. Arthur Miller, but then we speak about the um, middle of the 20th century. So relatively speaking, we are very new to the business of dramatic art, but this fact only emphasizes, I think, the achievements and merits of those Israeli playwrights who made it big time. 77 of our repertoire here in Israel is based on local original writing, and most of the major hits here are Israeli plays. I'd like to start our presentation with the late Hanoch Levin, whom you already heard of, who is considered by many as the most influential and important uh, playwright here. We'll dedicate a separate full session tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night to his work, but please let me just say a few words about him and about his works. Dying at 1999, at the age of 56, he left us uh, over six, uh, 60 plays in a variety of genres and styles. His originality, wit, and brilliant ability to peer straight into the human psyche in a manner that is simultaneously ruthless and, compa and compassionate, he, his hilariously pathetic or pathetically hilarious characters, all these have earned him a one-of-a-kind stature in Israeli culture and theater in particular. In recent years, he was translated into no less than 23 languages and, him, and had more than 200 productions worldwide, including by some famous directors such as the Polish Krzysztof Verlikowski. Among his most popular plays are The Labor of Life, The Child Dreams, Suitcase, uh, Suitcase Packers, Winter Funeral, Krum, and Requiem. Every night a play by Hanoch Levin is performed somewhere in the world, and let's just watch this short trailer, which will give us a clue about it. Please. Debajo de mi cinturón brota un culo soberbio, dos bolas carnosas rosado color, un surco fin de medio. De siempre me sigue el oculto detrás y donde quiera que va. Siempre está debajo. 
So this was Hanoch Levin, and more about him tomorrow night at the separate session. The late uh, Anat Gov, who died at the age of 52, and one can rightly wonder what is it with our playwrights, is responsible for some of the most successful and selling out comedies in the history of Israeli theater, and is definitely a part of what is described as the intensification of the feminine voices in our dramaturgy. Her plays, Oh God, Best Friends, Happy Ending, were produced outside Israel, in China, the United States, Argentina, Italy, Poland, Germany, Greece, Brazil, Russia, Uruguay, Panama, Mexico, Hungary, Britain, Czech Republic, and France. And some future productions are expected in Spain, the Netherlands, Finland, and Estonia. We look at just two examples uh, of her works. The first one is called Oh God. Oh God is the most successful of her plays. It follows the story of a woman psychologist who is about to meet in her clinic with a new patient for the very first time. And soon enough, it turns out that he is no other than God himself, desperately seeking help in need of therapy. It's been produced over and over again worldwide. And we'll see a short piece from the current production of Mildred's Umbrella Theater Company, in Houston, Texas. Please. This is crazy. What is? What's happening here? Am I hallucinating? Is that it? I'm clinically dead, and this is my hallucination because I can't afford to die right now. You're not dead, and you're not hallucinating. Th then what is it? Am I being filmed what? A lot. What? Look at me. I can't. It's me. No. Yes. Oh, God. Here I am. What? Who designed your costume? <laughs> I tried to look like that picture. Mm -hmm. I saw that you're taken with it. How many times have you had it reframed in the last year? 16. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not what? Logical. Ah. And apart from this, everything is logical. Everywhere you look, pure logic, right? Still. Still what? You're all prepared to believe in the biggest nonsense and not believe in the most self-evident thing there is. Your whole body starts to tremble when you see a black cat. You have a severe anxiety attack when a mirror breaks. Have you ever seen the digestive system from the inside? Who do you think designed that long and torturous tract that starts at the mouth and ends at the you-know-what? Have you ever tried to fold seven and a half meters into a belly half the size of a shoebox? How does the spleen which is only this big, know exactly when to secrete the enzymes that break down the fats that you consume in commercial quantities. And who do you think dreamed up the duodenum? First of all, don't talk to me in the plural. I don't know who you all are. I don't believe in anything anymore. No? The question God's existence again. The second example is from another um, uh, play by Anat Gov, the original production of House Husband at the Kamari Theater of Tel Aviv. The play, which is very funny and witty, tells the story of a family, a mother and father and their two grown-up daughters. The father is a pilot at the IDF who retires at the age of 45, and his wife and daughters, who are used to not having him at home with them for years, have now to adjust to a new reality of living together with this stranger. It's a very witty comedy which deals with family relations and its inherent tensions, issues of gender, and a constant battle of sexes. House husband from the Camry Theater. <laughs> 
מילד. ילד אפשר לפחות לשלוח לגן לכמה שעות. לקחת בייביסיטר, אבל הוא, הוא פשוט מונח פה. דבוק לי לתחת כמו איזה זנב, וכל הזמן ממלמל לי באוזן, למה את ככה ולמה את ככה? אני לא יודעת מאיפה אני שואבת את תעצומות הנפש, להתאפק מלהדביק אותו לקיר ולצרוח, סתום כבר את הפה! מזל שיש לי את העבודה, אחרת הייתי מתאבדת. ועד שהוא זז, אלוהים, עד שהוא זז, עד שהוא קולט משהו. את ממש רואה את הגלגלים של המוח שלו זזים. רגע, אמרו פה משהו, מה זה היה? הבן אדם לא מסוגל לעשות פעולה אחת בו זמנית. שריקה מעצבנת יוצאת לו מהפה כשהוא בולע. אף פעם לא אכלתי אותו שלוש פעמים ביום. מה את צוחקת? מרינה כמעט התפטרה לי היום. אני אומרת לך, מי שיפתח מעון לגברים בפנסיה יעשה מיליונים. דנה, אני מבקש ממך, תתני לי בבקשה את ה... את השלט. דנה, את שומעת אותי? איך את רוצה שאני אחזיק מעמד? איך? עברו רק ארבעה ימים ואני כבר יוצאת מדעתי ומחכות לי עוד שלושים שנה? שוב את בטלפון? תגידי לי, מה, כמה אפשר לדבר? מה יש לך לדבר כל כך הרבה? אני גם מבין איך את חופרת לא נשרפת. איך לא נופלת לך האוזן? איך לא נגמר לך הרוג בחיים? אני מדברת אחר כך. בדיוק. אני אשתדל. רק איתי אין לך זמן לדבר. על מה אתה רוצה לדבר? אני לא יודע, על מה שזוגות מדברים. אוקיי, על מה את רוצה לדבר? אל תשב לי פה עכשיו, אני צריכה לראות לנקות את כל הלכלוך שעשית. איפה את רוצה שאני אהיה? איפה את רוצה שאני אהיה? דנה השתלטה על הסלון, מרינה כבשה את חדר השינה. אוקיי, את יודעת מה? אני אלך לגור בשירותים ודי. לא, השיפוצניק של השכנים בשירותים. שלנו? כן, סגרו להם את המים בגלל השיפוץ. הערבי? כן. בשירותים שלנו? כן. אוקיי, סוף סוף יהיה לי עם לדבר. אל תפריע לו עכשיו! אולי תלך לסדר את הספרייה, חומד? תוציא את כל הספרים לסדר לפי א' ב'. כבר מסודרים לפי א' ב', גליה. כן, אבל הם מסודרים לפי א' ב' של הסופרים. נו. לפי דעתי צריך לסדר לפי השמות, ככה זה הרבה יותר קל. הרי לא תמיד זוכרים את השם של הסופר. מה? תגידי, גליה, אני נראה לך מטומטם? למה מטומטם? את מנסה לארגן לי עבודות יזומות? חשבתי שאתה אוהב את זה. גלי, אני טייס, כבר עשו לי כמה בחינות IQ בחיים שלי. טוב שאנחנו לא מתלהבים מעצמנו. אני מזהה כאן איזה לגלוג? לא יודעת, לא נראה לי כזה ביג דיל להיות טייס. מה אתם בסך הכול עושים? רואים את הצלב על המטרה ולוחצים על כפתור, לא? סתם, קטעים איתך. מכיר את הבדיחה על העכבר שתופס את אשתו עם הטלף? אז הוא אומר לה, מילא את בוגדת בי, אבל למה עם המכוער הזה? אז היא אומרת לו, מכוער מכוער, אבל טייס. מכיר? היא ממכירה. די, אל תשים לב אליה, יש לה הומור מעוות כזה, זה בגלל ההורמונים. יהיה בסדר. מה יהיה בסדר? אני מרגיש שאני הולך להתפוצץ, גליה. לא רוצה מים? רוצה חיבוק. מה זה? רוצה חיבוק. פעם היית מחבקת אותי כל פעם שהיית רואה אותי. פעם לא ראיתי אותך. היית מסנקת עליי, מפילה אותי על הרצפה. 
היית יותר קל. גליה, תגידי, את עוד אוהבת אותי בכלל? בטח שאני אוהבת. לא, לא, אל תעני כל כך מהר, תחשבי שנייה. את עוד אוהבת אותי בכלל? בטח שאני אוהבת אותך, אידיוט. אני רוצה שנתחבק יותר. כמה יותר? לפחות שלוש פעמים ביום. מה שלוש פעמים ביום? אוקיי, פעמיים. נתפשר על פעם ביומיים, בסדר? נתפשר על חיבוק אחד ארוך, מתמשך ואינסופי. מה קרה? עזבתי את אורי, ואני לא רוצה לדבר על זה. למה? מה קרה? אמרתי שאני לא רוצה לדבר על זה. אני יכולה לחזור הביתה לכמה ימים עד שאני אתרגל? לא. בטח שאת יכולה. בוא לסבתא, מה קרה? איפה היא תישן? אני עשיתי מהחדר של החדר עבודה. איזה עבודה? מה קורה עם העסק כאן? דניאל אלי חוזרת הביתה לכמה ימים. אני לא זזה מהחדר שלי, נקודה. אז מה, יש דרמה? לא רוצה לדבר על זה, בטח לא איתך. אני רוצה לדבר איתך על זה בכלל, כאילו זה מעניין אותי. סתם ניסיתי להיות נחמדה, כי אמא עושה לי פרצופים. בואי, תשתי משהו. יש לי עוד מזוודה באוטו. זאביק ל... למה כל משפט שמתחיל בזאביק ל... נגמר בזה שאני סוחב משהו נורא כזה? נו, די, תהיה נחמד. לך תביא את המזוודות. תהיה לי כאן. לברוח מהבית זה לא דרך לפתור בעיות. תודה, אבוש. למה כל משפט שנגמר באבוש... מחר אבא יפנה לך את החדר. ידעתי. הלילה תשני עם דנה. מה זה? ויואבי, שאני איתנו. מה זה? הילדה צריכה לישון לילה אחד רצוף? מי הולך לישון עם סבא וסבתא? מי הולך לא לישון עם סבא וסבתא? המזוודה! House Husband by Anat Gov. Welcome. Uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to our three wonderful live and kicking playwrights. Uh, uh, Joshua Sobol, Hadar Galron, Maya Radiasur, thank you for coming. Uh, let me introduce them first. Joshua Sobol is definitely the most successful and well-known Israeli playwright in the world. His masterpiece, Ghetto, had already over 80 productions around the globe including at the prestigious National Theatre in London, directed by Nicholas Heitner, and won the Critics Circle London Theatre Awards for Best New Play. His plays, and to this day he wrote some 80 plays, were translated to English, French, German, Japanese, Italian, Hungarian, Russian, Polish, Finnish, Turkish, Spanish, Yiddish, and many, many more. Who counts? Thank you for coming, George Vassobol. Hadar Galron, her first play, Mikve, which you can watch on our website, had already 17, correct me if I'm wrong? There was, there was another one a couple of weeks ago, but it went down after three days oh my God. in Poland, but it went on to streaming, but yes, yeah, so 17 plus half. 18, <laughs> okay. 18, be, be my guest. Had already 18 different productions all over the world, and her last play, Jewish Enough for Hitler, has just been produced in the Czech Republic, and its opening night has already been postponed three times, I yes. think, due to the <laughs> corona. You are very lucky, Hadar. Galron is also an active actress and stand-up comedian, and her one-woman show, Whistle, is also part of our program, and we'll get to it later on. And, least but not last, Maya, uh, last but not least, yes. Maya Aradias U, I feel like Oprah Winfrey tonight. Maya Aradias U became one of the most produced playwrights in recent years. In 2019, for instance, she had six different productions of her play Amsterdam in Germany, the UK, Austria, and France. And in 2020, another four premieres out of six which were originally uh, planned. Uh, four uh, other premieres materialized. Two of them are world premieres of two new plays, Bomb and the uh, Exiteers. So uh, welcome and good evening and thank you for, uh, for coming. Uh, the three of you, I think, have a lot in common. For instance, you all had some of your work produced outside Israel uh, first, before even having it done here. Uh, but at the same time, I think you represent three different generations and, and styles. 
But I want to ask you first, um, maybe, you know, um, an identical question. We'll just do a quick uh, round about your first experience with theater. Do, can you recall, Hadar, the first time you saw well, theater or well, came across? For, for me, I, 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 I grew up in a very religious society in London. So I was lucky that it was London because um, even the orthodox, even the ultra-orthodox uh, um, Jews in London have respect for theatre. Um, I, I remember, you know, as a, as a child, I wasn't a very good pupil. Um, I remember the teacher telling my parents when I was about 10, nothing will come out of this child. Mm -hmm. Only the drama teacher. <laughs> Only the drama teacher. <laughs> And uh, at nine, my, I had my first leading role as uh, Liza Doolittle. But I will say that That's my... That's a good start. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a good girl, I am. <laughs> uh, but I will say that my first uh, experience of theater in Israel was with Ghetto. And I was blown mm. away with this uh, theater, ex experience of theater. And it was the time when I said to myself, I want to, I want to be in theater. I need to, it was the time when I really started thinking of it seriously, so... Oh. <laughs> so we close the circle here. Joshua, do you remember the first time you, you uh, saw theater? My first experience uh, with the theater was, uh, I think I was uh, 12 years old or so, and uh, our teacher uh, of uh, music, he directed a production of a play about King Antiochus, the, the Greek... Uh, enemy of Israel at the <laughs> time. And I was given the honor to play the King Antiochus, <laughs> the Greek. <laughs> and I, I was, of course, beaten by the Hasmoneans. Mm -hmm. And I had a very tragic or a kind of very, yeah, a tragic monologue at the end, uh, uh, bewailing myself as, the, as King Antiochus beaten by the Hasmoneans. <laughs> so this was my first experience. Uh, and uh, then, my first play on the stage was a, a documentary that uh, I wrote for uh, and directed by uh, Nola Chilton. Mm -hmm. And it was about uh, people living in old people's homes in Israel, about old age. It was called The Days to Come. And this experience marked me, I think, for the rest of my career. This work uh, of uh, interviewing people who were then uh, octogenaires, I mean, I mean, people who were over 80. And um, I, cannot, uh, I, I, I cannot forget that experience, which really gave me a kind of uh, feeling what it is to, to bring to the stage uh, people who are so different from you, because I was 30 years old when I... Uh, very old. Yeah, yeah, very old yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, and Maya? Um. I do recall a few times that my mom took me to the theater when I was a child. And you I, grew up in Israel? I grew up in, in Israel, in Ramat Gan. Mm -hmm. And I think we went to Abima a few times and probably to a Canary theater. And uh, my mom liked theater and she dragged me every once in a while. And I was already from a television generation, I think. Mm -hmm. Not, it wasn't like today, it is today, but you know, mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the 80s. So, I don't even remember a specific play. It didn't leave much of an impression of me, I remember. I always asked myself, what is this? Why, what's the difference in telling a story between theater and, um, and television and film? And it, it always bothered me. I mean, there must be a difference in the, in the way you tell a story. But I always wanted to go again because of the applause. <laughs> this, as a child, the moment of the applause when the actors went out of their roles and showed their, who they are, you know, their real presence on the stage, it always brought me to tears and I thought, this is, I, I'm, I'm getting back to this memory all the time recently because it explains to me why I write like I write and why I like the kind of theater that I'm, I'm really a, a much of a fan of today mm -hmm. and then what I used to see as a child. Which you can define as... Uh, much more based on presence than mm -hmm. pre presentation than mm -hmm. representation. And in constant, I, I read somewhere, in constant search of its, its own grammar, right? You, you speak about that you, you try to 
to write plays which uh, are being constructed, you know, uh, as, as they move on. Yes, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also a PhD student and I'm researching the, the, the narratological potential of performative elements. Mm -hmm. So not the text, but other elements, the way they construct the, gra the narratological grammar of a performance. So mm -hmm. I search for that both in my writing and my research, yes. Great. We'll, we'll come to some examples later. Joshua, first of all, this Antiochus experience explains a lot, I think. Explains your obsession with history, I think. Uh, probably. From the very... Yes, yeah, I think so. I, I, I remember that uh, I had to identify with the character of Antiochus, you know, and it wasn't a very natural experience for a young Israeli-born Sabra at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, 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 well, it must have been in 1950 or so. I don't remember exactly the, the date, but... Um, and I think it marked me. I, I think that I understood at the time that you have to, on the stage at least, uh, you have to defend the character that uh, you are presenting. You cannot judge the character. Yeah. And I remember that when I, I had to, uh, to start uh, that dirge bewailing myself and saying, why did I start this war against the Hasmoneans and against the Jews, etc., etc.? I had to feel the, I mean, the pain or <laughs> and the, the real uh, anguish of that character. And it, yes, it was a very um, uh, constitutive experience, I think, in my life, uh, playing that part. And when later on you come to write um, characters like Kittel in Ghetto. Yeah, that's a, well, it's a very uh, good question. Because funny enough, when I uh, started to write the character of Kittel, I, I read about him, I uh, heard testimonies of survivors of the Holocaust who told me about uh, this very strange character, weird character of a 22, 23 year old young boy uh, that Kittel was when he. When he uh, got the uh, command over the ghetto of Vilnius. Mm -hmm. I remember the funny experience of having such pleasure in writing that character. Mm -hmm. The character of a, a man who allows himself, a young man, who allows himself to bring out all the bad urges, all the evil urges that are uh, contained in him. And I mean, uh, it frightened me when I wrote the character of Kittel because I felt how easy it is to indulge in letting uh, yourself, uh, letting yourself indulge in the, uh, I would say, in the, the weaknesses of your, your own character, mm -hmm. the tendency to, uh, to torture, to tor torment others, the, um, the uh, kind of uh, feeling of power, of total power that you have over other people, and, uh, and the pleasure of uh, uh, creating that character. So, you know, uh, it was for me a very uh, interesting experience, I would say, and also uh, I, I didn't stop thinking about it mm -hmm. ever since. And when I, I, had, I directed the play a few times, once with students in the United States at the Wesleyan University in uh, uh, Connecticut, and then recently in China, in Beijing. Yeah, we'll, we'll see it within a minute. Yeah, and I, I had to, uh, and the actor who was going to play uh, Kittle in, in Beijing, he was a very lovely person. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he uh, was used to be loved by the audience. And he brought to the stage in the beginning of the rehearsals a tenderness, a kind of tenderness. I told him, no, 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 it's not the way to, to be. So he said, what should I do? I said, well, if you want someone to come to you, you do this. Mm. He said, what? This is so rude. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> the next morning, I came to the uh, rehearsal room, and I saw him um, uh, doing it to all the actors who were uh, exercising there, mm. each one of them doing his job, and doing this. Mm. And, uh, well, he, <laughs> uh, he told me afterwards that it gave yeah. him such a very strange feeling that he could do this to other people. Mm. You know? For the very first time. Yeah, 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 for the very first time. You know what, if you mentioned it, let's, let's see. Uh, we have a clip of this wonderful production that you directed in, in China. 
Uh, I think it's it's uh, with with Hayale with the with the singer. Yeah. The, uh, by the way, the singer is a, is a Jewish woman. Really? Yeah. Her name is Anais Martin. She comes from a Jewish Moroccan family uh -huh. from Lille in France, and she has been living in China for the last twenty years. She's married to a Chinese uh, actor yeah. who is a great star there, and oh. uh, she, so she she she's already half Chinese, so to speak. But she has her relatives in Israel too. Yes. Where, where was it in China? This uh, we started it in Beijing. In Beijing. And then it traveled uh, throughout some 24 different towns in, uh, throughout China. Small towns, so uh, several, small, several millions. Yeah, well, yeah. six million, yeah. eight yeah, million, small, ten yeah. million. Villages. People. Yeah, villages. villages. That's oh. right. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's let's see this short clip of ghetto in China, please.
and wow. it was in Chinese. I would never have guessed that this was Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Mandarin Chinese. But maybe you, you know Cantone, Cantonese? Oh, oh yes, I'm a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always speak with my kids Cantonese. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the song was written uh, in the Vilna ghetto by uh, a poet who lived in the ghetto. His name was Shmerke Kaczerginski, and he wrote it three weeks after his wife, Barbara, uh, was murdered by the Nazis. He wrote this song, which is uh, it's called the Springtime uh, Thrilling in Yiddish. And uh, the music was composed by a composer, uh, Abraham Brodno, who lived in the Vilna Ghetto. And they performed the song in the G uh, Vilna Ghetto Theater uh, f uh, for the first time in 1940, uh, beginning, beginning of 1943, I think. Mm. So uh, we kept the music, and of course the, the lyrics were translated into Chinese. And, uh, Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Ghetto really became an international hit, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are a bit uh, tired with this question, but I must ask you once again, how did you um, come across this story at, at the very beginning? Where, where well, we, the truth is that what provoked the whole thing was a footnote in a book written by Rozhka Korczak, a oh. partisan from the Vilna Ghetto, who wrote a book called uh, uh, um, Flames and... Uh, Flames and uh, no, uh, Ether, uh, Ashes, Flames and Ashes. And uh, she was a member of the partisan organization in the ghetto, and they were opposed to the... Uh, founding of the theater in the ghetto, mm. uh, because um, they followed the slogan that was launched by the librarian of the ghetto, Herman Cook, who also figures in the play, uh, who said, you don't play a theater in a graveyard. Uh, because uh, when uh, they founded the theater by the end of 41 uh, in the ghetto, uh, already 60,000 of the 80,000 Jews of Vilnius were already murdered at that time. And then they founded that theater. And uh, so um, I g found a footnote in uh, Rojka Kolcha's book saying that uh, the uh, organization of the partisans was opposed to the f uh, founding of the, of the theater. And this is what uh, provoked uh, the whole interest, because I didn't know that there was a theater functioning in the Vilna Ghetto. Mm -hmm. And so I started my research, and then I uh, met survivors from the ghetto, and uh, between others the man who was the artistic director of the ghetto who survived the war, Israel Segal, and I found out that he was living a, a, free, a few blocks away from my place in Tel Aviv. I met him and uh, had a long, uh, long, long uh, talks with him about the theater. He told me many things, and uh, well, this is how it uh, all Evolved. started, the whole thing. I mean, uh, once I uh, got involved in, in, with that story, I couldn't stop uh, reading more and meeting more survivors and so on. And, so. and uh, in a certain way, the play kind of imposed itself and kind of, I would say, almost wrote itself. Uh, I remember that when I sat down to write it, I just couldn't stop and it came out like uh, in one, almost in one uh, burst, oh. the whole thing. Uh, yeah, this is what, what, uh, how it came to be, I mean, the play. Uh, but I, w I was not aware at the time that it will uh, uh, catch on as it did, uh, finally, because I thought it, was, uh, it, it would be interesting for an Israeli audience. But, uh, yeah, then uh, Peter Zadek in Germany produced the uh, German premiere two weeks after the opening in Haifa. And I was there on the very first evening in Haifa. You were in the as a child. Yeah. Unforgettable. Okay. Unforgettable. Yeah, for me too, I yeah. must say. And <laughs> so uh, this is what launched the play worldwide. Uh, I mean, Peter Zadek's production brought it out to the German-speaking world and shortly afterwards uh, to the rest of Europe and so on and so forth. Great. This was it. I, I said at the previous at the opening session that one of the... Um, most uh, characteristics, or I would say, uh, central preoccupation of, of Israeli drama is, is the Holocaust. And it seems to me that all three of you, each of you has his own Holocaust play. Uh, I, I see that you look at me. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at you. We'll see if we'll define it as a Holocaust play. But Hadar, you two now research 
uh, yeah. ca came across a story that uh, sent you to research, to a serious research. Uh, you're, you're talking about the new play, the new or play. Whistle, okay. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I didn't touch the Holocaust for a long time. I think it was uh, too strong for me. Um, and after I went through some difficult things in my own life, suddenly doors, more doors began opening up. And I, actually I had a first, my first Holocaust uh, experience was not with a Holocaust play. When I went to the Czech Republic to, to direct the secrets, before that, I had a, a performance in, uh, in, in London and uh, in the Westminster Synagogue. And they said to me, you know, we have a scrolls museum here. I said, what do you mean a, a scrolls museum? And um, he said, the Torah scrolls from the Czech Republic from the time of the Holocaust are here, upstairs. So I said, I need to see them. And he said to me, well, it's not opening hours now. So I said, yeah, well, it's not performing hours now either, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so he, got, he kind of got permission, got the key. And the first thing my eyes fell, fell upon was um, the ribbon that they uh, tie the Sefer Torah with. Because some, some of the scrolls had been sent to different countries. And this particular scroll that I saw only the ribbon of had been sent, had been fixed and sent. Um, I said, and, and the name underneath was Mlada Boleslav, which is exactly the place where I'm going in two weeks to begin directing. And I said, where's the scroll? Where's the scroll? He said, I don't know. We need to check. So I said, well, 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 then, well then we need, we need to find the scroll. And in, in, the, in the play of The Secrets, parts from the Torah scroll are on the scenery of the play. This, mm. they, are, they are screened. And, the, and then in the program is written that in Mlada Boleslav today, you can find remnants of Judaism, not only in the cemetery, but also in the theater. <laughs> so, um, and that actually, that, that production was where my whole, um, my whole project with, with uh, Jewish Enough for Hitler, or as it's called in, in Czech, my first Jewish Christmas began, because after the premiere, one young Czech woman, um, came up to me and said to me in Hebrew, Shalom, and I said, uh, Shalom. And then she began speaking to me in Hebrew how much she liked the play and that she saw Mikveh as well in the national. And then I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Where, where's your Hebrew from? And she said to me, uh, well, I've been studying Hebrew for four years already and I want to be a translator. And, and uh, she, she kind of has a Jewishy look. Um, and I said to her, and you're Jewish, yeah? And she looks at me and says, uh, no. <laughs> so I said to her, OK, the uh was much more convincing than the no. <laughs> so can I invite you for a, for a wine here across the road? And then she told me that her grandmother had been in Terezin, but although she found out only when she was taken to Terezin that she was Jewish, after the war she decided she did not. I said, OK, I need to meet your grandmother now. <laughs> and I met her with her grandmother. And then I began meeting more and more people. I, be I began to realize that many of the youngsters today of the young Jewish uh, community, in, not only in the Czech Republic in Europe, but uh, um, specifically in the Czech Republic where I, where I'm, where I work quite a lot, um, did, only found out at a very late age that they are Jewish or that they have some kind of Jewish connection. And um, I collaborated together with uh, Peter Svojtka and uh, Yizi Yanko. I always get mixed up with his name, so I just call him Yizi because it's easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so Peter and Yizi um, were the dramaturg and uh, director of a different production that was in the that was in Prague, and they collaborated with me. They, I said, I need to, I need to. They said, okay, the Liberates Theatre are really interested in this story. Mm -hmm. I said, OK, but I, I, I need to speak to much more people. Oh, we'll arrange it. We'll arrange it. So I, I, I actually met over 40 Czech Jews from the chief rabbi, who himself um, it was not born Jewish. Only his father was Jewish. And he, at, only at the age of 19, he began to deal with his Judaism. And the chief rabbi of Prague, who until some 20 odd years ago was a ballet dancer, um, and uh, amazing, amazing stories. And, uh, but, I, but I wanted to deal with this first thing of identity that the young Czech, uh, that the young Czech woman, the uh, no, and mm -hmm. I know that until today, and now she has an Israeli boyfriend, that this 
question of identity is tormenting. And when you suddenly go into, into hidden pieces of the past, it really broke up families. Uh, uh, people were mm -hmm. telling me crazy stories of what happened when they found out that the grandmother or grandfather or someone in the family was Jewish. What are we doing with it now? Because, you know, what came out of them being Jewish? Or who needs it? What's it good for? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's where this Amazing. all stemmed. And also asking myself questions of identity. Um, I, I know what it is to be a Jew in the diaspora. And I know that the people living in Israel don't know what it is to be a Jew outside of Israel. Everything's taken so much for granted here. Um, yeah, we have a state and we have a religion. and we, uh, It's a completely different feeling. So hmm. that's how uh, Jewish Enough for Hitler was born. Yeah. Great. And, and we'll come back to it later. Maya, which, which brings me to Amsterdam, uh, the story about an, 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 a Jewish and an Israeli um, girl living outside Israel, living in Amsterdam. Yes. And one day there is uh, some kind of a bill. Very strange bill. Yeah. It's true that the departure point of the play is very much rooted in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, but OK, Adal was talking about being a Jew in the diaspora. I think it's very much, Amsterdam is very much based on the experience of being Israeli in the diaspora, which is a totally different yes. experience. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, actually, uh, it's quite interesting how, how different it is. Um, Amsterdam is about being foreigner in Europe. And I think this is why theaters in the world are also interested in it, because it's, it's semi-biographical. So naturally, the Holocaust could not be left out of it. But, um, the but you know what? Let's see the, the, the opening scene of it. Okay. Do we have the, the London production of, of Amsterdam? Uh, by Maya, uh, you studied yourself in Amsterdam. You, you yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, let, a, let's see. I think it, I think it speaks years. for itself. We we would like to see Amsterdam of, of Maya from the the British production. Let's see it. She. Um, what do they call it? She uh, took a bite out of Amsterdam. Took a bite out of Amsterdam. Right. Like it was some sort <coughs> of omelette. She took a nice juicy bite out of Amsterdam. Right. Like it was some sort of omelette she'd made without even cracking her eggs. She couldn't crack her eggs. She couldn't crack her eggs. Okay, what, like in a glass ceiling kind of way? Uh, no. She couldn't crack her eggs? There was no glass ceiling. Hell, there wasn't even any ceiling there. Just eggs. A pair of them she literally had in her hands, but couldn't crack to make the omelette. Or pancake. Or whatever it was she was trying to make. Yes. So, she didn't crack the eggs. She didn't crack the eggs. No, she just let them run in her hands. Or maybe she just put them back in the fridge. Or whatever, because what was it? The gas was turned off? The gas was turned off, that's it. The gas had been turned off, because... Well, here's the thing. She has no idea why. Her gas had been turned off and she has no idea why. No idea why. The truth is, she has no idea why her gas should have been turned off until all of a sudden, 8.27 a.m. and all of a sudden, a knock at the door. The postman? No, the postman never takes the stairs. Not ever. Not ever. In Amsterdam, the postman never takes the stairs. In Amsterdam, the postman just pops the envelopes through that flap thingy in the front door that's facing the street. A uh, flap thingy, right. It just pops them through. They start piling up on the stairs in bulk. The residents get in the stairwell, and because they'd like to avoid having to step on a pile of envelopes, they take their time digging out the ones that are addressed to them, and the rest... Yeah, well, the rest they put together in a perfectly neat pile and leave it on the second step. Could be the third step too, though. A fourth step, at most. And this uh, postman, uh, Hendry he's called. Yes, Hendry. He's not your garden variety postman. <laughs> oh no. He isn't some Joe Schmo cycling around town in the dark, delivering people their letters just to make ends meet. He's not? No. Man's a biomedical engineering student. But the postman's not 
very crucial here, is he? Well, no one's really all that interested in hearing about the postman. Not really. The postman could be a biomedical engineering student. He could also be a street tramp, for that matter. A rock star. Refugee. Hell, he could even be one of the royals. The, the point is, the postman is just a footnote, because the only thing we really care about are those envelopes. The envelopes that he pops through the front door flap thing is day in, day out. That's how it's done in Amsterdam, and they all do it the same way. And Victoria always gets them stuck in her heels. Nailed. We'll have to come back to Victoria a little later, because right now we have... A knock at the door. But they don't knock on doors in Amsterdam. Except there very much is a knock at the door right now. And there is no way it could be anyone else. Anyone but the upstairs neighbour. Because it's a small building. Only two storeys, and each one's only got the one flat. Only the one flat, that's right. And no one, no one but her and the upstairs neighbour, has the key to the front door that's facing the street. Well, it must be the neighbour then. Must be the neighbour. The one called Jan. Must be the old upstairs neighbour called Jan who's always smoking those cigars that stink out the stairwell. So the play follows 24 hours of her attempt to find out where this debt originated, actually. Yes, so she wakes up one morning and she wants to make an omelette and she finds out she doesn't have gas. She lives on a beautiful uh, canal in Amsterdam on the Kaiserschacht. Um, she's a violinist and she's Israeli and she's Jewish. But I think we saw, what, three minutes, and I don't think the Holocaust was yet mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, soon enough, she finds a, a gas bill on her doorstep, which is really big, 1,700 euros. And she thinks, OK, that's not possible that I used so much gas. Something is weird about this bill. And then the performers who are constructing the story throughout the performance um, not necessarily agreeing with each other where the story should lead, which is what leads actually this construction. Mm -hmm. And um, so they follow 24 hours of her life with that gas bill in her bag. And uh, when she finds out that it uh, originates in 1944, and it's so big because it carries interest and uh, fines and whatever, she and they, the performers, are really occupied with the question, who lived in the apartment back then in 1944? That's the question, because she's supposed to pay the bill. So who lived there and who should pay the bill? And you said it's, it's, uh, it's semi-autobiographical. And you lived, in, you lived in an apartment in Amsterdam that I you didn't live on the Kaiserschacht. You didn't live on no. So it's not autobiographical. It's not. It's <laughs> totally it's so fake. I lived on, a, yes, on the Albert Kaup market, which was not less of a beautiful experience. Um, I lived there for seven years. I studied dramaturgy at the University of Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And then I started working as a drama, production dramaturg for several uh, companies uh, for seven years. By the way, all three of you, originally you write in Hebrew first, right? Yes, of course. Um, yeah. It happened to me once to write uh, originally in English. I wrote a play about Alma Mahler mm -hmm. for uh, the uh, Austrian director, Paulus Manker. And uh, the, our common language was English. Uh, I speak German and I read German, but I cannot write German. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I wrote uh, Alma in English, and uh, it was performed in German, of course. Paulus Manker himself uh, translated, translated it into German. And then I had to retranslate the play into Hebrew. It was a very strange experience for me. <laughs> Something yeah. back to Hebrew. So back to Hebrew, yes, yeah. yes. I, I, I'm completely bilingual. I write, and I write in English and in Hebrew. But not in Czech? But not in Czech, no. Mm -hmm. no. And Maya, you're, you're I, there, I wrote suspended in English. I wrote it when I was still living in Amsterdam, and I wanted to write about immigrants, and I thought, I can write about immigrants in the West in English, because that's the English I speak myself, so mm. it's going to be natural. Mm. But mm. I wouldn't dare any other. So all, all, the others the, are, are all the in, others are written originally in Hebrew, in Hebrew and are getting to, translated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I think this production um, demonstrates the 
the place or the freedom you allow a director. There is a lot of space, and, and, and you spoke about uh, the show actually uh, being constructed on stage, and I feel that there is, there is a, a much of a dialogue between you and your directors, whereas the, the two of you, the, the bit older ones, you, you started directing yourself. Yeah, you, cool. you, in recent <laughs> years, you direct Ghetto. How, I how won't go into that uh, topic. The older Who's generation? Older she grew yeah. up in the 80s, Hadal. She's, uh, Hadal? So nice. yeah. What can we say? We are the same. We share the same thing. Well, I, I, I started directing. Uh, <laughs> for the first time, I directed, uh, yeah, it was Ghetto. My play, a Ghetto, that I directed in Essen. Mm -hmm. in Germany. That was the first time you directed yourself? Yes, in 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, it happened to me to direct uh, my own place and uh, also other place. One of the productions that I directed was uh, The Merchant of Venice uh, at the Illinois Shakespeare Festival mm -hmm. in uh, 2000, in the year 2000, I think. I enjoyed it very much, I must say. I discovered, uh, I mean, uh, I found out that uh, I had a lot to learn from Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Not only then, but uh, I mean, it was a very interesting experience to, and, and once I directed a play by uh, George Tabori, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, the Goldberg variations. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise I directed the Ghetto, I directed some other plays of mine here and there, yes. Um, but most of the time, I but find my, that... my question is whether will you ever go back to letting other people direct your own plays? Oh, or? yes, of course, of oh. course. I, I must say that uh, I, I adore working with other directors because then they add a certain uh, dimension to the play, which I couldn't add because uh, when I direct my own play, of course, I try to forget that I wrote it in mm. order to be free to deal with the material and to see where, where, where I have to make cuts or to, uh, to change things and so on. Uh, because I think that, well, of course, theater is a creation of a team. Collaborative. And uh, very collaborative and, very, and you have to bring everybody to be creative. And then, of course, if the director is a different person, I believe that it adds something to the uh, riches of the production, finally. And you had some very long-term relationships, I think, with, with Nola Chilton, you mentioned before, and Danny oh, Besser. Yes. And yes, with Nola Chilton, we, we did together a few uh, uh, productions at the Haifa Theater at the time, mm -hmm. and later on in Savta, and also at the Abima one production. And with Gedalia Besser, of course, I co collaborated with him uh, for quite a time. I had the chance to work also with uh, foreign directors who were very, very, uh, 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 very interesting uh, artistic personalities. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, you mentioned Nick Heitner, who did the, the Nicholas Heitner, who did Ghetto, and uh, I served a, as a kind of dramaturg in the production mm -hmm. at the National Theater. I was present in all the. Uh, I attended all the, the rehearsals, but not only attended them, but uh, also cooperated somehow with uh, Nicholas Heitner. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, Peter Tzadek, who was uh, one of the greatest directors in Europe at the time. And Paulus Manker, who is a very special man of theater with his uh, own vision, a very strong vision. Um, so I, I must say that uh, I do enjoy working and also with young, young directors, uh, I worked with uh, uh, Aya uh, Kaplan, mm -hmm. who is a young director, yeah. and I loved working with her. And uh, so I, uh, well, if I'm given the chance to direct, I'm very happy about it, but uh, I'm not insisting on it. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. And in recent years, it, it, it seems to me that you had, I, I think I mentioned it before, but you, you had many of your plays produced outside Israel, which, which haven't been done here yet. It is true, yes. Although written in Hebrew originally. Although written in Hebrew originally, one of the latest uh, plays that I wrote, uh, which I wrote in English, actually, it was uh, the Marx Banquet uh -huh. uh, for the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx. I wrote it for a uh, German director, Manfred Langner, mm -hmm. who is the intendant of uh, the uh, municipal theater of Trier. Trier is the town where Marx was born and grew up. Mm -hmm. And they uh, celebrated the, the 200th anniversary 
So, and I'm very close friend with uh, Manfred Langner. He directed already a few plays of mine. Uh, so we spoke and he said, uh, what's your attitude towards Karl Marx? And I said, well, he influenced uh, uh, quite a, a few years of my life when I was in the kibbutz, <laughs> yeah, you know, kibbutz. and so Shamir. Yeah, yeah, Shamir, and uh, well, I'm quite a good friend with him, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> with Karl Marx. So I wrote a play about uh, the young, uh, young Karl Marx uh, mm -hmm. and in a form of a banquet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 19th century, they had in Paris, at the time of Louis Philippe, uh, uh, they banned uh, political um, uh, meetings. Mm -hmm. And so the French found a way to bypass it by uh, arranging, banquets. arranging banquets. Everyone had to pay, I think, like six francs mm -hmm. at the time in the in 1840s. And uh, then you got your uh, probably uh, your uh, beer and or wine or whatever, and during the banquet everyone could uh, clink on his glass, stand up and uh, hold a speech, give, give a speech, <laughs> give a speech, uh -huh. yes, deliver a speech, and uh, so it became a kind of form of political uh, banquets that. Uh, somehow prepared probably the uh, revolution of 1848 in oh. France and uh, throughout Europe. Interesting. So uh, the play about Karl Marx, so there were other plays. I wrote a play about the Biedergutmachung, uh, the um, Shilumim, the English, what would be Compensation, the compensations uh, from, from Germany. Germany. Yeah. And it was also produced in Germany. It was never produced in Israel mm -hmm. so far. I hope mm -hmm. that one day maybe it will be done here. And uh, a few other plays that were done uh, abroad mm -hmm. and uh, are waiting to be done in Israel. Yes. High time they did, someone did something with it. I want to share with you something which, uh, some question from the, um, the chat. Someone asked us if we have some kind of an explanation to the popularity of Israeli dramaturgy uh, in Europe as opposed to in America. I think uh, all of you have had more productions and more. I think it's, it's, it's similar. We, we are doing very well, uh, or Israeli playwrights do, are doing very well in Europe and, and not so much in, in the States. I think um, Ghetto is maybe an in, uh, in example. Yeah, Ghetto was done in the United States uh, like four, five or six times. Mikva One, was uh, done uh, twice in the United States. States. States yeah. Yeah. And once in Canada as well, and once in Mexico. Not quite America. Still. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that the whole system works differently there. Uh, in the States. Yeah. They, first of all, they, have, um, they don't take productions for... Uh, the system in Europe is more, is more similar to the system in Israel. The, a production can carry on for longer. Mm. Uh, in America, they have like 30. They take it Limited for a month. Limited so, Yeah. Mm. Um, but to the actual question of why... Um, I also, I, I also asked myself, because the uh, mikveh was produced only in Jewish theaters, whereas in Europe it was produced not in... Regular. You know, for, so... Okay, a good question. Uh, our Very good panelists question. Uh, don't, don't have a, a specific answer. Uh, another thing which I see, and we'll come uh, back to it later when we will host here uh, Shimrit Ron, the director of the Chanoch Levin Institute for... Uh, Israeli drama, uh, and she'll speak about where you can find all these wonderful uh, texts and scripts for students and everybody. Uh, here, someone asked where and how um, may drama students find these plays to see, read, and perform. So she'll, she'll discuss rights and everything um, uh, within um, a couple of minutes. Um, Hadar, let's, let's turn to Mikve. Uh, Mikve, okay. as, as we said, uh, um, was being produced uh, 17 or 18... Uh, 17 and a half. 17 and a <laughs> half, if you insist. And uh, it was done in, in Poland. You, you mentioned this... For the first time in Poland. For the first time now, in Poland, with an amazing timing. Yes, because the same, the same uh, week that they began Mikva, in Poland, um, there has, they've been prohibited to have abortions for any reason. I mean, in the whole of Europe, there seems to be kind of a going back more to religion, as we feel it here as well, on, from a different religion, but the same kind of... People are looking for answers, 
And uh, in Poland, in the same week that uh, Mikva was, was premiered, um, women were prohibited to, to have abortions. It, it, it was in law. So from the theater, when you went out, there was um, a protest of women, and the actresses joined the women. And there's a whole dialogue in Mikva about, you know, who do you think you are to decide if you want children or you don't want children? What God gives us, we need to accept. You know what, for, for the few who, who didn't come across this play, can you just give us a short synopsis of what, it, what it's about? Well, it's, it's actually eight stories intertwined, um, but it's, it's about it, the, the, the physical space and maybe the spiritual space of the play is, uh, is the mikveh, the, 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 the bath, the ritual bath, the ritual bath which religious women after their marriage um, need to take in order to be, uh, in order to have any kind of physical contact with their husband. So they come once a month to the mikveh and uh, purify themselves. And a new mikveh lady, a new mikveh attendant comes. That's the beginning of the play. And she cannot, she cannot turn a blind eye to a battered woman or a bride that's getting married to someone she doesn't know. Um, although she's supposed to turn a blind eye, but she, all this, she sees these things so clearly and she can't shut up. So it kind of, she changes the status quo of what's going on in the mikveh and uh, uncovering secrets and lies and things that have been held down. Let's see the, the wonderful uh, trailer of the Polish current production of mikveh. Błogosławiony jesteś Boże, nasz Król Wszechświata, który uświęciłeś nas swoimi przekazaniami i nakazałeś nam zanurzanie się. W mykwie niczego nie wolno ukrywać, ale to nie daje nam prawa węszyć. Przełykam wszystko i milczę. I milczę. Przejdzie przez to tak, jak wszystkie przechodzą. A jeżeli nie, humor in the play. <laughs> there is, there is certainly, yeah. And actually, I, I believe many of our guests uh, saw the Israeli production at, at Habima National Theater running right now, um, directed by Rafi Niv. Uh, I think Jewishness and, and womanhood are two central motives. Um, by me, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even in and the, the stand shorter up, answer, even please. In the <laughs> <laughs> Even in the stand-up, I mean, I, I always say, I do, they say, you do stand-up, yeah, but only about things you're not allowed to laugh about, which is, <laughs> which is being a religious woman, which is the place where I come from. Uh, uh, Jewish law and womanhood are... But I think that if giving it a, a bigger, a larger title would be identity, mm -hmm. um, which is, in, in a way, what I'm dealing with in, in the new play as well, is identity. It's, it's kind of seeing where I fit in, where I am, because I'm, I'm an outsider. I mean, I, I came from, I'm, even when I was in London, so my father was uh, Moroccan and Israeli, but we were there and we we're going to Israel and we came to Israel and for them I was, uh, I'm from England, but for England I'm Israeli and for them, my whole relationship with religion, okay, so for the religious you're secular, for the secular you're, you're the religious woman. Yeah, so it's kind of, I find myself all the time kind of an outsider, so... Um, as maybe as an artist, there there are it's a good it's a good point of view, um, but it's something that I'm dealing with a lot. And you are the only one here who hasn't decided yet whether she is on stage or off stage. Uh, <laughs> what do you want to be when you are grown up? <laughs> no, I'm not going to grow up. First of all. We've come okay. to that. We've discussed that point already. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's jump into the water and 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 get our guests. Uh, a clue or, or, you know, the first Israeli premiere of this new play by yours. 
Okay. Uh, Jewish enough for Poland. Hitler. Okay, a world um, premiere delighted right, right now. To uh, and we are going to do two you. dialogues. It's, just, it's, uh, it's a world premiere because pl the premiere in Czech Republic hasn't was happened yet. Postponed, <laughs> okay. A world premiere right, right now. Uh, and we are going to do two dialogues from this wonderful new play. Uh, maybe you introduce the characters and then okay. we'll, we'll just um, do it. Well, it's a family that they find out that the grandmother, on, on Christmas Eve, there is a, a conflict between the grandmother and the granddaughter, and the grandmother then later admits that she is actually Jewish. Mm -hmm. And this kind of makes the whole family flip. I think that that's all we need to know for these. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a dialogue between an, uh, uh, Magda, who is the granddaughter who wants to fight for her, for her grandmother's right to be buried as a Jew, and her uncle, Frantisek. Okay, so I play the uncle. Magda, you can't promise Babichka something that's not under your auspices to fulfill. What are you talking about? Her burial. It's not for you to decide. Right, it's for her to decide. It's not so simple. We need to see what it means. It's very simple. She wants to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. She is recovering from a stroke. She's over-emotional, and we are not even sure this whole telenovela is true. I'm sure it is. Let's say it is. Let's say her mother was Jewish. So what? She never lived as a Jew. She already bought herself a plot next to Grandad. If you ask me, by tomorrow, she'll get over this whim. Whim? Yes, Magdush. Don't take it so hard. It's like the headlines. Today's hottest news is used tomorrow for cleaning windows and wrapping fish. Oh, you would use Babichka's will? to wrap a fish. Magda, why do you always take things out of proportion? Me? Can't you hear yourself? Look, we won't bury her in a Jewish cemetery, Magda, because it would automatically make us all Jewish. Well, Babichka's not quite the kind of person you can decide something like this for. Well, when a person is dead, there are certain advantages. Well, she's not dead. But she will be when we bury her. That's uh, generally the custom. And what about now, while she's alive? Whilst she's alive, I want my mother to be as happy and healthy as possible. Ah, so you'll lie to her? You'll lie to her. Don't expect me to cooperate. <laughs> and then she goes to the rabbi. <laughs> mm. Because it's not as if someone... Two in the price of one. <laughs> now I'm a rabbi. Okay. It doesn't, doesn't mean just because you want to be Jewish that you're allowed to be Jewish. No. Mm. What do you mean not enough? To prove she's Jewish. She is Jewish. We just told you our whole life story. Look, let's say I believe you. Again, let's say? I believe you, okay? Why would we make up a story like that? Well, uh, for uh, Hagibor, maybe? For what? The Jewish old age home. Everyone knows, every, everyone knows it's the best one in the Czech Republic. Look, Mr. Rabbi... Cohen. Uh, call me Jakub. Jakub, my babichka will never go to an old age home. Never say never. Never. She'll die in her own home, not in some institute with strangers, and she'll be buried Jewish because she was born Jewish. Where is this written? You, you saw her mother's name in that book of Psalms. That's not enough, Maedele. It was enough for Hitler. What? I said she was Jewish enough for Hitler. Doesn't that make her kosher for the Jewish community? Well, actually, no. You see, Hitler wasn't a rabbi. Oh, really? Hitler was an anti-Semite, so for him, anyone with a grandmother or a grandfather up to three generations back was considered Jewish. But by Haloche, the Jewish law, only those with a Jewish mother are Jewish. Her mother was Jewish. So bring me a document to prove it. Tam tararam, tam tam. <laughs> Not Jewish enough for Hitler, a new play by Hadar Galron. Uh, Maya, let's talk about the two very exciting plays that you wrote last year. Well, I didn't write them last year. It okay, took a Being while produced. to write. Okay. Yes, two of my plays were uh, pr opening this year in 2020, well, despite everything. I think you are the only playwright in the world that had so many premieres mm. this, uh, this last year. No, yeah. the theaters in Germany were open for a while this year, so mm. in this a while I was, <laughs> I was opening my two uh, productions. One of uh, my play, uh, Bomb, the mm. title in German was Bomb. Uh, the title in Hebrew is A Light Shiver in the Wing, Ad mm Kalba -hmm. Kanaf, and uh, it opened in February 2020 in the Schauspiel Cologne. Just before we had our first lockdown. 
Yeah. Yes, and they had it just a bit later. Mm -hmm. And just a month ago, I went to Germany to the world premiere of the Exiteers, Blaue Stille in German, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately now is not uh, running because of the lockdown in Germany. So let's let's talk about Bomb a bit before let's before we it. see. Maybe you you want to tell us something about what it is just to, um, to give us a in, in Bomb I. I sort of tried to, I, I, um, Amsterdam won the uh, Theater Treffen Sturm. And in this play, I'm developing the form that I started um, using in Amsterdam. I, um, I have three threads of narrative being interwined by the performers on stage. So if Amsterdam was a minimum of three performers, mm -hmm. that's the only directing instruction mm -hmm. I have. You were talking about the, the freedom, freedom I give, give uh, my directors. Directing. So this is more or less in, in Amsterdam and in BOMB also the, the only, I think, the only the instruction. I call it recommendation, even that. Mm -hmm. um, so here you have three groups of minimum of three. Um, the performers are uh, constructing the story. It's kind of an interpretation of a um, piece of performance art of a woman that is um, stepping on cherries in an aquarium and pulling out her hairs and gluing them to her arms. So it's a very abstract piece of art. Mm -hmm. And the performers are starting, they're Western performers, and they kind of project their um, desires and ideas on this abstract piece of piece of work and very quickly it turns into a story a war story because the artist i have to say comes from a conflict zone mm. where from no. <laughs> we won't so, tell. don't ask don't, don't tell we don't okay. say <laughs> so let's see the world premiere of bomb by maya radius or in germany just before the um, lockdown Es war eine Schule. Wenn er an seine Tochter gedacht hätte, hätte er bombardiert. Er hat keine Tochter. Ja, dann soll er die Tochter seines Nachbarn denken. Eine Schule. Er, er blickt von oben auf sie. Er denkt an die Tochter seines Nachbarn, an, an Naomi, wie sie von ihrem schweren Ranzen gebeugt den Weg zu ihrem Haus entlang läuft. Sie aufrecht auf ihrem Stuhl in der Klasse sitzt und Wörter von der Tafel abschreibt. Er denkt an sie. An sie denkt er. Das war ein Terroristennest voller Munition, die auf sein Haus zielt, auf die Betten der Kinder von uns allen. Das war eine Schule. Ein Munitionsversteck. Dann sollen sie da Bodentruppen reinschicken. Damit ihr sagt, ihr müsst nicht nach der Straße stürzen und wir die Leben von Soldaten in Gefahr bringen? Sind Soldaten keine Kinder? Haben Soldaten keine Mutter, die mit weit offenen Augen im Bett liegt? Die Decke am Start und wartet, dass das Telefon nicht klingelt. Dann soll man ihn nicht losschicken, um Kinder zu töten. Fordert er. <lacht> fordert, okay. Er kann fordern. Aber er stellt hier keine Bedingungen auf. Er beschließt, die Schlüssel zurückzugeben. Bomben. Uh, we are running out of time, so I, I want to ask you um, one final um, identical question. What are you working on right now? How does this corona uh, find you all? Well, the, the corona uh, found me very, very busy writing uh, a new play, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the title of which is uh, Requiem for Dead Birds. And it is about... Uh, uh, a, a total collapse or a, um, ruination of a whole civilization that is falling to pieces. And uh, among the debris of the remnants of that uh, civilization, which, constitute, which is constituted of a broken blackboard of a class, uh, computers, broken computers, broken firearms, uh, a tail of an airplane, and so on and so forth, people are rummaging there in the debris, and we find out that they come from all over the world. So it is a kind of uh, what is left of a, of a ruined civilization, and those creatures who come out from the from the ruins, ruins. 
they are trying to find a way to live together there and to, to find out uh, with one another who they are, why they are there, what brought them to that uh, kind of catastrophe, and uh, what are they going to do with themselves. So this is one play. And the other one, I, which I wrote recently, uh, is called What's on Your Mind? And it's about uh, people who were told not to speak to one another too much because talking endangers your uh, partner because you are you spit. spewing out uh, bacteria and the viruses and so on and so forth. And of course, not to touch one another and to keep a distance. So a young couple who were uh, high-tech people, they invent uh, mind readers uh, so that you don't have to talk to your to partner. Speak. You read his mind, he reads your mind. And uh, then you have also a kind of device which sends uh, kind of uh, waves that imitate human contact. So you can send a, a wave that is functioning like a tender uh, touch or a caressing, and mm -hmm. another kind of wave that is uh, messaging you, massaging you, and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, uh, this kind of thing is what uh, replaces what we are now doing, talking to one another, and sometimes even daring to touch one another. And they have to sell it. So it is a kind of a comedy. They bring another couple there uh, of a, a, an investor who is a, 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 a billionaire, and he's... Uh, they try to pitch it. Yeah, and they, exactly. Mm -hmm. And they, they convince them somehow that it functions by causing a kind of a terrible orgasm to the guy <laughs> and to his uh, partner. <laughs> and they realize that, yeah, you can manage without even... Uh, coming near the, uh, one another, and uh, there is a kind of virtual uh, sex going on, virtual contact going on, and virtual dialogue. Joshua with... Sobol, yeah. playwright of uh, the one who played Antiochus, yes. a serious person. You know, can... Well, uh, now we are talking about uh, the great... Prestigious uh, <laughs> international prizes, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> no, they are talking about the great uh, restart now, or the, the great uh, reset. Reset. You know, yeah. the yeah. great reset. So I, I'm waiting to see what it will be. <laughs> but it probably it will, it will be about reading our thoughts uh, in advance and knowing what we are going to do. And you will get an announcement from, I don't know, from which uh, department of the government. Listen, don't go out tomorrow because your mind is uh, preparing something which you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that uh, this is what is going on now. We are Very being, Orwellian. Well, we are being... Uh, Replanned, re mm. uh, uh, yeah, Program. programmed yeah. exactly, yeah. and uh, we. Well, I, in a way, I wanted to protest against the kind of uh, mentality of sheep, that uh, we are receiving our orders from a kind of a, 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 I don't know what authority, and we behave like sheep, like uh, nations of sheep. Yeah. Maya sounds like a play you could have written. But I can't because Yoshua is already <laughs> because writing. Because Yoshua is already <laughs> too great. What, what's your current project right now? I'm busy now with a play that is a kind of a simulation of doctors in a hospital in a natural disaster area where there are fires going around the whole region and people coming one by one with a... She fought a sham. They've been smoke, smoke, smoke inhalation, smoke, yeah, I think. They've been um, and they don't have enough uh, ventilators in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually, uh, I was inspired by a post by uh, Ilan Rosenthal, the director of uh, the general Tumunat director Theater. of Tmuna Theater, who posted, uh, what if a father and a son come to the hospital and there's only one ventilator left? And I asked for his permission to take it and write a play out of it, and he agreed. And now I'm busy with that. I took it a little bit further from epidemics. Mm. Um, but again, it's a simulation because the doctors, as I always write, they reconstruct several Narratives. scenarios, and they could be a father and a son, and the father could... It's, it's very much about ageism, naturally, mm. because the first... The natural selection, I don't know what to call is the it, one. is the younger one. Yeah. But then I give so many details about the older one. And there starts, uh, um, there's this moral question of who deserves to live and who. 
I mean, if you have to make that choice, then what are the criteria you will have to consider? So these doctors are constructing several stories that are less predictable than the normal one, and they shake the, the first answer that you'll give this question if you have to, I guess, mm. which was interesting. Kind of dominant this year. Very interesting. Brings me together to the, once again, to the insulin dilemma in, in, yeah. in ghetto and the That's doctors right. there. Thank you. And Hadar, what, what's with you? What's, well, what's next? I don't know whether I'm allowed to say this here, but I'm doing a bit of TV writing. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. And also, um, <clears throat> also uh, there, there is this play that's been writing itself in, in bursts of, uh, of, of kind of monologues about the relationship of a woman and a cockroach. A cockroach. Yes, yes. Okay. She's she's in lock. She's in quarantine. I did three quarantines. She's in quarantine, and nobody will open the door. Her husband, her kids, nobody wants to. They're all scared of her. Mm -hmm. But she's in quarantine with a cockroach. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yes, and it. But it gets it gets uh, really far. She's sure that the cockroaches are taking over the world. They are now trying to change people actually into you know they 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 kind of they for 280 million years the cockroaches have been getting used to the surroundings. Now they want to change the human people into cockroaches, putting them into little black holes that they come out only for food and for essential needs. And Hadar, too much uh, Prague, <laughs> too much Czech Republic, too much Kafka. That's what, that's what I hear here. Thank you all very much. I'm so Thank sorry you. we ran out of time. And please let me introduce Shimrit Ron, our next uh, guest. Please uh, come over. And uh, she is the director of the Hanoch Levin Institute for uh, Israeli Drama. And we'll uh, like her to join us. I'm looking at the chat to see. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Really appreciate your putting this together. Thanks, Hadar, Maya, Shimrit, and Joshua. Thank you all very much. And someone at the chat, Joshua, uh, said that your play, The Merchant of Stuttgart, yeah. was part of his uh, thesis or, or yes, some, some kind yes, of... Yes, yes, that's right. It opened in Stuttgart uh, two years ago or so. Yes, oh. exactly. Okay, yeah. so you had someone here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank Hi, you. Shimrit. Thanks a lot. Uh, so this is the wonderful Shimrit Ron, director of the Hanoch Levin Institute for Israeli Drama. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes left, but I, I cannot let go without you introducing the institution, what you do there, and especially this uh, question that uh, came out in the chat, how do one get the rights or how to contact you if we are interested in Israeli plays somewhere? Okay, so thank you for, for the introduction. So my name is Shimrit Ron, and I'm the director of the Hanoch Levin Institute of Israeli Drama, which hosts uh, the Israel Drama every year. Um, it's really new to do it uh, online, but uh, we have the possibility of inviting 200 people and not only 50, so it's uh, quite a nice advantage. So, uh, during the whole year, we actually represent Israeli playwrights abroad. So, uh, if somebody is uh, having a theater and is interested in Israeli playwrights, uh, they can write to me. Uh, I think that you can uh, put my email in the chat. And uh, to actually purchase the performance rights uh, of the plays, uh, it's very simple, like every uh, other agency in the world. And the um, variety of playwrights and the uh, subjects and themes uh, of uh, Israeli playwriting is so huge. So I think everyone can, can find uh, something. something that he likes. Uh, I know I, I thought that recently theaters are searching for uh, smaller casts, uh, but now there are also theaters uh, which sh search for a bigger cast, cast because they want to uh, make a, a, a photo, or make a, a movie out of it. So uh, it depends. So you can contact me and you can uh, ask for plays uh, for what, what you were looking for. And uh, I think you will find something that you like and you can uh, produce it, uh, translate it to your own language. Uh, we at the Institute are also translating plays uh, to, from Hebrew to various languages and we are always in search for good translators uh, who can convey the uh, humor and the nuances and the unique language of each playwright. Uh, and I'm really proud of uh, these uh, playwrights that you've seen, but uh, there are also many others, uh, Hadar and Maya and uh, 
um, Joshua Sobel, of course, uh, and we have Hanoch Levin. And if there is a time, I can tell you about uh, one mm -hmm. comedy which is related to the Holocaust as well. I know it's comedy and Holocaust, but I can. Uh, I, I think I think we, we are running out of time. But we, you probably refer to Gur Koren and Nava Semel and, yes. and, and Savion Librech. There are so many great uh, Israeli uh, playwrights that uh, Shimrit can uh, send you all their materials, and, and you you are more than welcome to contact her here. You have her email address at, at the chat. Uh, we thank you very, very much. Thank you, Shimrit, thank for you so your, much. your great contribution to uh, uh, spreading out the word about Israeli uh, drama. Thank you, Roy. Uh, can also be a reading of a play and not a whole production. Yes, yes. everything is possible. Yes, of course. There can be a stage reading. You can have a stage reading. You can have a student production. You can have a, a big theatrical production. Whatever scales of the productions that you are searching for, you can you can do it. Like every uh, everything like, is negotiated. Yes, like yeah. like every agency in the world that you can uh, contact and purchase the performance rights. So it's the same. But it's Israeli. Thank you all very much here to Daraba from Montreal. Thank you Montreal. Thank you, Thank you everybody for, for being with us. I just want to remind you that tomorrow at five o'clock Israel time we'll have. Uh, our third session, which is called Take Away Theatre and dedicated to small scale productions. We believe that, you know, once the corona is over, people will look maybe for uh, productions which are very uh, easy to travel. So we dedicate one session to small solo shows or small scale productions. And then at seven o'clock, the special uh, panel about Hanoch Levin. Don't miss uh, it. Worldwide, really don't miss it. We'll have a Pulitzer Prize winner, Jessica Cohen, who translated it and uh, Globe winner Ari Fullman, director of Valsin with Bashir, uh, talking about his experience with Hanok Levin. Tomorrow, seven o'clock, Israel time. Thank you all for being with us, and Laila Tov.